start up again. All righty, our next speaker tonight is going to be David Shorthouse. David, take it away. Can you see that all right? The thumbs up? Yes, sir. Hey, okay, thanks, Kate. So um, I've entitled this talk, Slinging with Four Giants on a Quest to Credit Natural Historians for Our Museums and Collections. Um, and you'll see my orchid way at the bottom for a very good reason, um, as you'll find out in a moment. So um, before I um, get into the meat of my talk, I wanted to at least alert everyone to the, the notion that um, um, it's very important to be linking people uh, to biodiversity data. Um, and it's also equally important to recognize the people that are doing the linking of the biodiversity data. Uh, and uh, there's a new paper that will be appearing in database um, within hopefully the next little while um, that was assembled by myself and co-authors about the rationale for doing this work, you know, linking person to natural history specimen data or biodiversity data. And lo and behold, there's a very long tail of folk um, that we may know very little about that might have um, collected a single specimen versus the vast majority of um, usually in some holdings, you have a, a handful of, um, of folk that have done the vast majority of the collecting. Um, so anyway, how, how do you get, you know, how do you resolve this long tail? It's partly what, what my talk is all about. Um, so um, Rod may be getting very tired of seeing this diagram, um, but I enjoy looking at it. Um, and there's uh, several ways of interpreting this diagram. Um, you might interpret this as a technical vision. Um, so it's ultimately about building tight, uh, codependent kind of relationships among entities. But it's also about um, building tight, codependent collaborations. Um, and hopefully, when, when thinking of this as a network, shedding local responsibility for the digital maintenance of some of these entities, they're not mission critical to a particular uh, institution, for example, and favoring instead the mutual outsourcing of significant, significant parts of this graph and redistributing some of that technical debt among um, stakeholders that are responsible for some of those entities that are willing to shoulder that. Uh, and so by having done shedding some of that responsibility, um, can you receive local benefit through access to enriching tools and services that would you know, perhaps not otherwise be possible because you've got legacy, narrow, rigid design decisions. And so overlaying this work is a hope for more flexibility. So what I'm about to describe is one single link within this um, uh, graph, the link between person and specimen. And I was pleased to hear some notion of, um, of um, an idea of there being you know, static facts associated with our specimen-based data. But in addition to that, we have this, uh, this idea of a dynamic shearing layer or several dynamic shearing layers, layers around these statements of fact. Um, that are very much in flux. And, and this is where the data quality work really comes into play. You know, do you regenerate all your data quality tests as some of these kind of shearing layers of data in flux get improved? And so that might be re-identifications, enhancements, corrections, or very you know, mundane things like administration where specimens get transferred from one institution to another. Um, there's, there's this layer of flux and you have to contend with that in the, in the midst of trying to do the linking among entities within the network. So how do we hang our coats on each other's coat hooks? And another alternate take for this kind of question is what does it really mean to be fully dependent on each other? So I want to try and make this link between person and specimen. Um, and how do you do this on the cheap? So well, I'm gonna do, you know, use the tools that I'm familiar with and I'll set myself a boundary of a, maybe hundred dollars US a month maximum, because if I'm gonna do this, I wanna do it as quickly and efficiently as possible, not spend a heck of a lot of money. So this is my budget and I'm gonna use Scala, Spark, um, uh, various tools to process large amounts of data from GBIF. And I'll establish a presentation layer using Ruby, uh, Elasticsearch and Neo4j. Um, so very off the shelf uh, open source materials. And, and throw up I, a website and I'll call this Bionomia um, and open up the world uh, to the capacity of linking specimen uh, to a person and what that might look like. And so many of you here probably are sitting near collection management systems. You may have an agent's table that you share information from. Um, and this 
figure here is, is an illustration, at least my attempt to illustrate what happens when some of that material winds up on GBIF. You have what I would take, like to call a dirty bucket. Uh, and this is comparable to the kind of scientific names that appear on GBIF. You know, the agent names are comparable to what happens there. And so they've got a dirty bucket of names of people. Um, and over on the other side, what I'm hoping that we might be able to do is make a clean bucket. So we'll use things like ORCID, Wikidata, and others to try and um, clean up some of that unresolved lists of folk um, to um, um, other entities like ORCID and Wikidata. And so also in part and parcel of this dirty bucket is the notion that you need to refresh what's happening there. So drop it, rebuild it, and drop it, and rebuild it time and time again because there are improvements that are happening. And so here are the four giants, ORCID, Wikidata, GBIF, and Zenodo. And that's me, David, at the bottom right, who is slinging with these four giants with my hundred bucks a month. So every two weeks, I go trawling through GBIF, download the entirety of the specimen-based data, and I look for a preserved specimen, fossil specimen, or living specimen, or unknown. Oftentimes, things wind up in that spot. And um, GBIF, as of last week, have put in production a mechanism for me to make this much more efficient, you know, a custom download uh, specific for this biomimic project um, that really streamlines this whole process. So kudos and thanks, GBIF, for having done that for me. It makes this my world much easier. And so some generalities. Well, a quarter of all these 210 roughly million specimen records lack a collector determiner. That's kind of interesting. And oftentimes, as we heard earlier today, um, there is a notion of this problem with basis of record. Um, and that needs to be contended with as well. And oftentimes as well, the GBIF IDs evaporate for a number of reasons. And I, I won't get into those kind of details at the moment, but just be aware that there is, there's a flux at the, the identifier level as well. And so what do we need to do to clean the bucket? Well, I'll start with parsing the names. And so I've built a, a Ruby gem that's reliant upon many other folk that have done this kind of work in the past, like Sylvester Kyle and Aaron Patterson. And so here kind of layer on top of it to kind of clean up some of the dirt in the dirty bucket. And this is a test driven Ruby gem. And also take advantage of some other work that's done in the library community about trying to disambiguate folk based on nothing more than the structure of names. Um, and I can take advantage of this and I put it in Neo4j. Uh, and so these pairwise comparisons of given names and that materializes on, on Bionomia as a single checkbox to say, if you wanna look at more dirt, check here. If you wanna hide some of the dirt, don't check the box. And so ORCID, here is the second giant. ORCID provides a persistent identifier for people. Um, and this is what I want to kind of hang my hat on or hang my coat on. So ORCID for the living and um, take advantage of some of the tools and services that ORCID have built, such as authentication. And so we get a, a immediate bit of data back from ORCID when people use that OAuth authentication mechanism, you know, get a given name, you know, the country that might be affiliated with some of their aliases if they've included them and take advantage of some tools and services that have been built um, that I can also hang my coat on such as these Ruby gems that are, are in wide, wide use. And so authentication is relatively easy. Likewise, the APIs of ORCID are relatively easy to take advantage of as well. And as, as long as an individual has made this bits of content um, public and accessible, you can use them. So aliases, activities, addresses, biography, all those kinds of things that might supplement to help this business of disambiguating specimens to people. And Wikidata, and I use it in a very specific way for the deceased. So aliases, birth dates, death dates, affiliations, all those kinds of the bits of information that are accessible in Wikidata. And each of these have the capacity uh, to store evidence right in Wikidata. So there's some kind of confidence level associated with these as well. A few minutes. Yeah, thanks. And so a hat tip to Magnus. Um, um, he has um, been one of, the, one of the stalwarts in this community who's helped me a great deal, come up with some really hard questions. What do you do when you have merged records and how to deal with that? And so I also have Ruby gems um, to take advantage of this kind of work as well. So Zenodo, the last one. Here's me. Um, and it wouldn't be lovely if you could archive your data somewhere after having gone through the effort of making these connections. And these are my specimens put it somewhere to give yourself some kind of credit. And so here I'm making use of, again, OAuth authentication with Zenodo, push those data sets out into Zenodo, get a DOI, and that might appear into your ORCID account. Um, and lo and behold, it's very attractive to a number of folk, early career taxonomists, um, where we have a, a DOI that then appears on their Bionomia page to give a notion of credit for the work that they've done. 
And what about the deceased? Well, here's e. Ebbing Nielsen as an example. What do we do there? Well, lo and behold, um, there's a quite an emotive capacity for folk who, who recognize that there's a, a rationale for making these kind of links. And, and going through that exercise, you realize that you know, there's a lot more than just science going on here. There's a lot of um, really interesting kind of connections with other communities. Um, and so what's happened since October of 2018 when I launched this project? Well, 963 people have logged in, 600 and some have made claims of their own specimens, 95 have made what I call attributions, you know, other folk and their specimens, deceased or living. 17 folk have made more than 100,000 of these kind of linkages and a few uh, hat tips to uh, Kyle Kopis and uh, Siobhan Leachman, who together have made more than three and a half million of these kinds of linkages. So we've got to do something about that. So let's kind of get this data flowing back into the institutions. You know, with my hundred bucks a month, that, ha that cannot stay there. That must go out back into the institutions. And so let's close another loop here and make, the, make this data available to folk who, such as in, in fricklish, frictionless data so they can absorb it back into the institutions. So I'll skip a few slides to some questions at the end. What does it mean to be fully dependent on each other? Well, sensitivity to motivations, a mutual understanding about the cost of sharing these links, a willingness to both police and help each other when things go wrong and the linkages are incorrect, and anticipate the ripples that might kind of cascade throughout the network if, you've, if you must break a link. And so we need a mechanism to express the confidence in those kind of linkages. So metadata on links, well, it's kind of obvious. You've got directionality of the link, sure, but who made the link? Why did they make it? When did they make it? Is it meant to be persistent? Does it have an expiry date? Um, did there used to be a link that has now been severed and why? What's the rationale for that? And so in Binomia, I also have these negative links. No, that's not me, that's not them. How do you share that around to make sure that might get reused in the community? So, and finally, last slide. When transcription is happening, such as in WeDig Bio, elsewhere, in collections management systems, can we make these links while those while the business of transcription is happening, not just put text in there, but make the link out and go through that cognitive effort of actually making the linkages out and resolving them on at that time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Super interesting. And we actually already have a handful of questions for you. Uh, Yort says, in my experience, mo most money is spent on training and paying humans instead of rent, uh, renting server space and software licenses. Factoring this in, how much can you do for $100 a month? <laughs> so I've been quite facetious there with this $100 a month. I, I'm, what, what I'm hiding in there is the real cost in the human effort of doing this. Um, and if it weren't for the volunteers and folk who are actually going through the effort of going through these exercises and making one small link within that network of the biodiversity knowledge graph, um, we would have a hard time actually doing this. Um, sure, you can do some of this at scale and in an automated way, but there will invariably be, you know, the long tail of things that just cannot be resolved by a machine. So um, I don't honestly know how to answer that question. That's a really, really hard one. If you want to build a knowledge graph, that's going to take immense amount of effort and um, human power. Fantastic. All right, a uh, question from Rod Page. Given that you use Wikidata, uh, Wikidata IDs for people and Bionomia tweets, Jane Smith collected family X, would it be useful if we could get a list of publications from Wikidata, infer what taxa were studied and derive a similar statement? Jane studied, study, studied family X, um, would that help identify people? Yeah, absolutely. And this, this really touches on the reconciliation and resolution of folk. You know, what kinds of, what complements of data and extra kind of linkages to other things would help resolve who an individual is. And that is, has great benefit um, to a number of entities that, and a number of data objects. And so I've been exploring um, the complement of kinds of additional bits of metadata that would feed into something like an open refined endpoint, which is uh, accessible now for Bionomia. What else do we need in order to improve the likelihood and the score that that is precisely the person who we think it is when we have nothing but an agent string? All right, and from Richard Piles, so what persistent identifiers for non-living folk? For non-living folk. Um, so um, uh, probably the best bet at the moment is something called VF. 
Um, so you, you could use Wikidata as an identifier, but really it's more like a broker of identifiers um, where there are multiple linkages to folk um, that uh, are held elsewhere. So like the, the, the HUH, the, uh, the Harvard uh, Index uh, of um, Botanists, uh, IPNI, for example. Um, uh, lo and behold, Rich, the, the zoo bank identifiers are also there in Wikidata as well. So uh, for the deceased, um, I would recommend uh, VF. And without that, uh, or you know, even just use the Wikidata queue number as well. Uh, Annabella Plus asks, for the deceased, do you think uh, if we add some info at the stuff flow at, at all, um, just for, you know, just for botanists, because sometimes there's not a biography on Wikipedia. I, I missed the first part of that question. Could you, could you repeat that? Sorry. For the deceased, do you think, um, am I missing something? Do you think we should add some info of the, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, stuff flow, stuff flow at, at all? Let me copy and paste this into of the taxonomic literature, but it's just for botanists. It's a book that you have all the information of the collector and the date, uh, the places that the person was working and the places that they used to just leave all the types and all the publication, but it's really just for botanists. Yeah, so I, I, Nikki put something in the chat there that kind of ring, rang a bell with me now. What we're talking about is TL2, uh, which is commonly known uh, as this um, work. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, it's been on, on the, the back burner for me is to kind of, kind of parse through TL2. And I think a number of us in the chat here and, and listening on have probably done some of this in the past already. But if we get that kind of information on Wikidata when there's a home for it, that absolutely will help this whole work as much as possible. So you know, one of the key messages is that we don't, don't want to do this in a vacuum, and that's where Wikidata is really shines. You know, and, and the whole notion of of shedding the the local storage of data and and off setting that and onto Wikidata uh, for the whole communal sharing of that is precisely why it's so powerful. Great, thanks. See, the next question uh, is: There a point beyond that? adding one more link facilitates inferring multiple other links? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I wish I had invested a bit more of my upbringing, uh, upbringing in, in sort of network analyses um, and that kind of theory behind it all. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, the more links that we add, the more and more powerful are the resolutions. But there's also the, the kind of notion where you might just add that one more link to one other entity or one other kind of class of item that would completely break your confidence in some other link, links. Um, and so there's always be mindful of that kind of situation as well. And I don't, I, I don't have an, ans an answer for that one. I wish, it be, uh, I wish I knew more. Great. And finally, Lauren asks, uh, things like Jane did not collect in country Z, et cetera, mm. could, be, uh, could be useful to add as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of harkens to the not me, not them kind of buttons I have within binomia. You're going to look at this, the sea of specimens that you know might be yours because it matches your name in some way, but you just don't want to see these things time and time again when I refresh from GBIF. That's a signal there of, of there being a sort of a negative link, a negative assertion. How do we use that? I honestly don't know. Uh, I hope more intelligent people than me here can figure out um, how that, that kind of stuff might be revealed and reused. Because you don't want to be in a situation where you kind of make that erroneous link at some point in the future, and then you know we have to sort of self-police our community to you know you're wrong. I've got to break, keep breaking that link. And Lauren follows up with, do, you, do those buttons encode a negative link beyond that single click? Oh, but just unlinking that single instance. Uh, does that sort of it, does that mean um, does that sort of negative assertion propagate somewhere? Is that is that what the question is about? Lauren, do you want to clarify? You can take yourself off mute. 
No, that's exactly exactly what I was asking. Yeah. So when you click that button, it just unlinks just that one instance, that one connection. Um, if if it did propagate or, or if it just remembered, that would be quite useful. Um, I I think I've un, I've unlinked myself several times from the same batch of specimens as mm. somebody else comes along and, and reads a label and thinks it's me. Right. Um, that's just my my own situation. But um, I just wondered if there's what can it become can it either be propagated or can it be become kind of firm until it's an active uh, change. Really That's a very good question. You know, it's, it's comparable to, you know, the edit wars that might appear on Wikipedia. Um, how do you ensure that there's um, some kind of level of assertion or confidence about having either made a positive link or a negative link that would supersede someone else that might kind of, you know, edit or over edit? Uh, you know, it's a darn good question. It deserves more thought. All right, and we're right at the edge of time. I think we've got time to answer John's question. Is there any link between your work and GBIF's new clustering? Could that be used to assert collectors? Yeah, that, that, again, you know, that, that's also on my $100 a month <laughs> bucket list of things to do. Um, you know, that there's so much um, uh, enthusiasm in doing this now, but it, it's remarkable. Um, and kudos to the whole community in thinking about this. Um, absolutely, you know, doing the clustering there and taking advantage of that uh, so that people aren't overwhelmed if they're going to be thinking about connecting themselves to their specimens as a, as a rationale and a reason for assigning credit, you know, in some way to their administrators, you know, let's make it as easy as possible, please. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. That was a fantastic presentation and great job answering the slew of questions that came after. Right. Thank you.